Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and by PressUp, friendly web consultants who listen to your goals and provide solutions that make sense. Online at pressupinc.com. Pretend I, I know nothing about London, which is not that far from the truth. I you know something, but let's say I'm totally ignorant of London. How would you answer the question of what is Hackney? Um, Hackney is something that's absolutely unreachable or incapable of being defined at the moment because it's one of the most elastic, um, the most virtual, most colonized most battleground states of, of, of the whole of the city. It's come to, to represent a form of the new London. Because what London was, I mean, it's a very simple story of geography, really. Uh, the fact of the, the sheer fact of the River Thames, which gives access to the world. Mm. A trading city building up, um, very specifically the old city of London, the walled city. And then the suburb, the move to Westminster, city of government, and then there's a path between Westminster in the west and the old city, which is business. Mm. That city now becomes global corporate entity. It could, it could be anywhere. Mm. And the other stuff spreads out into a series of villages. One of these villages was Hackney, which in the time of Samuel Pepys was somewhere pleasant and rustic and uh, about three miles outside the city of London, where he was sent as a child to recover. At that time, distant. Distant. I mean, a, a good a good walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a place with a with a, a brook called the Hackney Brook. A river went through. Very grand houses and villas. A lot looking down on this on this river. Orchards, um, and places like schools for nice mm. young ladies grow up around Hackney. So Hackney is very desirable. And in the way of a city, then, because of the river, you get industry, you get dirty industry, Hackney begins to go downhill until, by the time I moved here in the 60s, it, it's a, a symbol of inner-city blight. It's mm. twinned with Lambeth. Both got active left-wing councils, both got enormous projects putting up blocks of public housing, um, everything is run down, everything is collapsing. At this moment, it's the symbol of this push to, to move the whole of London socially, culturally, economically to the east, mm. based around Westfield Shopping Mall in Stratford and its attendant park uh, where the Olympics were held. And Hackney itself has exploded into, into a series of block developments, often tied into the new railway system, the overground railway, which links everything with everything. And it's become hyper trendy. There's this infinite fashion outlets, bars, absolutely overnight. Uh, property values have exploded so that these small Victorian terraced houses are going for like a million pounds. Mm. Um, and so, culturally, from the place that I moved into in the 60s, where anyone could come, and there were lots of houses multiply occup occupied by. Um, squatters or, or people carrying out different projects, left-wing projects, anarchists, all sorts, to now where property is impossible for young young people, and uh, and you so you 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 turned into a different city, totally, and it'd be a very interesting place to explore from for the outsider for that reason to see how a plastic a city can become. Mm. And Hackney is where we sit today, by the way, on Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, talking with Ian Sinclair, who writes fiction, essays, poetry, best of all, books that combine all three of those and other forms under the scheme, usually, of geography, of London geography, of, of Hackney geography. You'll know him from books like Ghost Milk, very recently, American Smoke, most recently, Lights Out for the Territory, London Orbital, Downriver. If we listed all his books, we'd be here all day. So I'll ask you this. What do I miss about Hackney? What do I, what can't I understand by simply walking around it today? Literally today, I was walking around it. What don't I, what don't I see that's most important? 
Well, you're, you're, you're starting the right way because mm. the, if you want to know anything about it, you need absolutely to walk around it. Mm. The only thing you don't know about it is the fact that you'd have to go on walking about it for the rest of your life mm. because almost every stone... I mean, the, the, the thing of London, it's so impacted, it's mm. so layered, it's so overgrown. Mm. And yet, weirdly, this house that we're sitting in now, this small terraced house built in 1850 by a speculative builder who extended out from London Fields, which is down a, a park ground at the end of the road there. This is the very first house actually built on this piece of ground, even though we're, we're no distance from the city of London. Where we were were all market gardens and brick kilns. Nothing went down to build this house. Nothing was pulled down for it. It was it was a, a piece of scrubby farmland, mm -hmm. um, supplying the the food for the for the city and providing the bricks with which um, much of London was rebuilt after the Great Fire of 1666. Uh, and so that's uncanny, and that's part of an explosion that happened in that mid-Victorian period, when you suddenly get the railways and the canals coming in in the way that now. There's a new explosion going on with the overground railway, the elevated railway that links up all of London with all of London. So there's a circular railway now, and you see great blocks of flats being built right alongside the railway. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would say if you wanted to get a sense of Hackney, you could follow the project I'm doing at the moment, which is I've walked around this entire global, <laughs> global um, circuit of London yeah. um, right out to... Wilsdon in the, in the west and out to Stratford in the east and looked at what's underneath the railway. It's as if there's a great tunnel around London. And in this bit here, if you, if you walk down to Haggerston Station and went south, you'd see underneath the railway arches where once there would have been strange motor businesses, uh, tyres, things that didn't want to be seen, grubby, dirty businesses. Now there's a, a space with a... a designer gym where people who work in the city go to at seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. next to that is a is a, a space that looks like an art gallery that's selling pink and yellow fish in flat screens <laughs> for over two thousand pounds each this is like meditation devices for people living in the new community of hackney next to that an artisan bakery mm -hmm. so someone doing fancy bread that these are city workers who are, who are downsizing to make bread mm -hmm. next to that of a Japanese restaurant. So you've got this really extraordinary culture growing up there underneath the railway. Go the other way mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's nothing. It's kind of blighted territory and the only things happening near the railways are, are messianic religions. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a plethora of black religions that you can hear chanting and, and Christian um, fundamentalist places that, that are very extraordinary and a whole a cluster of shops that have been colonized in um, Aquascutum, Burberry, yes, yes, yes. Pringle, the big brand names wow. have been shoehorned into Chatham Place mm. uh, looking pretty absurd uh, <laughs> as, a, as a bit of window dressing mm. for taking on the building which was a factory in Working Hackney, textile mm. factory, now being turned into loft living apartments. I mean, this is a familiar urban picture, mm. but it's, it's very deeply and closely associated with the railway, which in its own turn was structured to suit the Olympic Games. Ah. So that became an amazing motor for a kind of what some people would look at regeneration, some people would look at as degeneration, but a, but a remaking of this landscape. So you couldn't get that, you know, really, unless you absolutely dedicated a month to just walking and, and picking and listening to stories around the place forever. It isn't, it isn't the kind of city that, that's going to open itself to you very quickly. I mean, you can build up a reasonable superficial picture very quickly in the sense that I, I think I did when I was uh, in places like Vancouver or Seattle. I mean, I don't know them, right. but you, you can spend a short time walking about them and pick up a sense of what's going on. Mm. This London Overground Railway, I've, I've been on it a few times, and to me, having just arrived in London a week and a half ago, it's all part of the transport system. It's all of a piece when I look at that map in the tube stations. But I talk to people who have been riding the tube for decades, or even just years, and they... They'll describe the overground as kind of a blind spot in their 
in their mental map of the city's transport. Like, yeah, that's, I guess that's there. It's not really, they, fit, they haven't really integrated it into their consciousness. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Is that, is that a phenomenon? One of the strange things about the overground is that it works. <laughs> <laughs> so it's unusual, is it? I mean, this is, uh, theoretically it works. Uh, but but if, if you go onto the station, nearest station, Haggerston, trains come in every two minutes. You don't have to hang around. So... It's it's a, there's a sort of big division is operating between the sort of democracy of the bus system, mm. which are like viral torpedoes. Everybody's <laughs> coughing, and and everybody is jabbering in a million different languages, right. all, all all on their mobile phones, all slightly aggrieved, all shouting that the bus is a is a democratic entity. Whereas these the train service is already seems to be pitched at the incomers who are living in these blocks of new flats, mm. all with state-of-the-art bicycles on their balconies yes. and they're, they're going in there and um, it doesn't quite do what it seems to do it's supposed mm. to go around this circle but it doesn't you know you have to stop and get out and transfer mm. and weekends they don't work it doesn't really work mm. uh, because they're still working on the line and what pretends to be brand new as in London so often is not new at all because mm. there was already a line from Dalston Junction down to the city of London mm growing out of the Victorian period, which was to shift city clerks down so they got into work so money wasn't lost. Wow. Well, they, during the Thatcher period, which is when all of this really exploded, she took that railway out, closed it, and said it was no longer required and nobody wanted it. What this was really about was that they were developing Liverpool Street, where the station had been, to create Broadgate Circus, which is a pastiche of New York. If you go down there, there's the skating rink, there's sort of <laughs> generic buildings, art by Richard Serra, all that stuff, which was all to do with something else other than what it appeared to be. And the, the railway then stood empty until the Olympic era, when they suddenly decide they must reintegrate this thing. And so uh, it opens up as if it had, it had been their invention. They take credit for it, but it was there all along. And that's... Mm -hmm the truth of a lot of things in London. They've been there all along. Um, political imperatives reinvent something and claim the credit for it when it was it had never gone away. Mm. It takes only a look into the past that perhaps not many are willing to do. I don't. It feels like there's so much writing done on all kinds of London history, but then is there also a blindness publicly to... To, to that sort of thing? What, what, what the, whole, the whole idea of, of politics and development is, yeah. is about fixing history. Ah, fixing history. It, it, you, you'll go through a permitted section of the riverbank and there's a particular story will be laminated on a board for you to read. <laughs> this was a gunpowder mills, this is where such and such an explorer set off, the Mayflower launched from, you know, the, these very simplistic notions of history are put up. They never give the entire story, and by telling one story, you're hiding other stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the developer will always try and justify themselves. You, you can put up an enormous block of anonymous building that's going to serve some insurance setup and um, reference the fact that there's some Shakespearean theatre once stood on the site and there's a couple of stones left in a basement you might mm -hmm. be able to go and see. <laughs> that's how London history works. It's a... Uh, it's a fix, right. and who's who? And the, unless you uncover it for yourself, there is no history. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. it's a light show put on by the politicians. Would you say in your own books? Would you say you're trying to pitch them between as many stories as possible? Are they? Are you trying to be on the other end of the spectrum from here is the story? And are you your books? They're not in themselves stories, but they connect to as many stories as possible. Does that ring a bell at all? Well, I think that was my attempt to, to reflect this uh, overwhelming reality of London, which is is made up from so many stories. Yeah. There is there is no there is no truth. I mean, I'm certainly not accessing it. Yeah. All you can do is is fall into conversation with with people who have an investment in a particular area and let them tell their story. And to access that other thing, which I think is true of London, of London being a city of books, mm. that it is this sort of vast library of information and tales. And I've, I suppose I've looked at it that way because I was a street book dealer. I right. was 
scavenging around and, and acquiring books in street markets and thereby you know, you know getting an understanding of how the circularity of uh, money works in London mm. that, that for example I, I could find a book in Brick Lane market on, on a Sunday morning yeah. which you pick up off literally out of the gutter I would <laughs> curate it in some way by choosing it, take it to a stall in Islington, which is a little bit upmarket, mm. sell it to a middle rank dealer, mm. and by the end of the week the same book is in Savile Row in a glass case. <laughs> it's made its way in out. One week, it's <laughs> gone literally that way. And I've seen all the moves. Do so, you remember a particular book that did that? Um, yeah, 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 many books. I mean, I might have, uh, say, found a a book that was uh, inscribed by Raymond Chandler when he was living in London and was very drunk and he did he <laughs> scrawled a presentation inscription to his TV producer and it's in the street for mm -hmm. 20 pence I've, look, I've picked it up and I've recognized what it is put it out of my stall mm -hmm. now it's up to 50 pounds mm -hmm. uh, you know, some middle dealer buys it to sell on somebody else and it um, finishes up like uh, 500 pounds in, in the course of one week. Mm. Well, that's, that's an example I can give you because I was in it, but I can see the same process happening with so many other things, mm. that London is a series of hierarchies. And what killed this street business to a certain extent was that people wouldn't accept this genetic chain, yet that some dealer at my level would, would want, would seem, that book's in several row for 500 pounds. I want 500 pounds. <laughs> you can't have it. You know, that you've got to go through that process. All these people who are taking their, their piece out of it. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone refuses to accept his point in the chain, the whole system breaks down. Mm -hmm. And the Internet ha had the part of it, what it did, was to even everything out. That, right. that, that, that there was no longer possible for all these various stages to occur because you, you can just go on it and there are a series of fixed prices. Right, you look up on your phone in the store, what does this cost? Yeah. And so, so now you get people kind of actually look, see a book in a store and then they look on Amazon <laughs> and see you, yes. can, you can get it for this and then they walk out of the store. So the store is just a showcase right. which, which kills the kind of notion of independence mm -hmm. and difference mm -hmm. that, that London was based on a series of very specific localities, all with different qualities. Mm. And now there's a kind of uniformity. Mm. Because if you go into a Barrett block of new housing at Dalston Junction, it's just the same as another one down in Woolwich or, or Clapham. Mm. Yeah, this, is, this is the nature of the city, that that, that fabulous difference which was there. It is, I mean, it is a, it's a big place. London itself is... is True London is small, but the accumulations that have piled up around it make this huge entity. Ford Maddox Ford was talking about in early part of the 20th century, um, putting a compass down in Fleet Street set to 50, 50 miles and making this great sweep around London of 50 miles and stretching it to take in Oxford and Cambridge and all that would be a kind of London. Mm. And, and I think that was true. That's just what happened, that, the, that this particular area zone becomes a city with high property values and so on separated from from the rest of britain mm. when did you what what was it that first revealed to you that this flattening was happening well the, the flattening this flattening process be, began it with with the jump into the virtual world out of the real world mm. and, and and obviously with with the explosion of the internet and all of that which I didn't recognize it when it arrived. I mean, it was just, to me, initially a nuisance. That I'd be out walking with people and they'd be on these funny phones that, that yes. actually, it was like, I felt it was like being tagged, you know, when you're a, a, a released criminal. You had to wear an ankle tag. Yes. And when you had one of these phones, people knew, knew where you were. You never shook off the office. You never shook off business. Mm -hmm. And I walked never away from it. I mean, I walked around Hackney, the borders of Hackney, the outline of Hackney with various people at the time of Hackney Road Empire. Mm -hmm. And one of them I was walking around with uh, the writer Will Self, and his mobile was going every two minutes. You know, to, Everybody was wanting him to write a piece for the stand, blah, 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 blah. Yes. So, but that detracts enormously from the, from the presence of being where you are. Right. And I, I think the process of walking about you, you talked at the beginning, is just a simple way to, to be 
a part of the substance of the city mm -hmm. and to flow with it rather than to move in fixed lines the way people want you to move. Mm -hmm. Because the new geographers have got this theory of pedestrian permeability. Mm -hmm. You step out of the station and you, you can only walk one way that takes you into a mall. <laughs> and they do not want you shooting off and trickling down side streets where there might be a funny old cafe or a right. man repairing shoes. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's you're straight in. And these, therefore you're coming onto a kind of more rational grid-like structure like New York is being imposed on London. Mm. Now, many people have found your books, many readers have found your books through, through hearing you described as a man who writes about walking in London, which represents only a small part of your actual career, but that's how many find their way to you these days. Do you think that has anything to do with those ringing mobile phones? People, people maybe subconsciously want to hear what it's like to just walk around a place. It's, it's, they seem to, seem to be coeval. The, 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 uh, the popularity you've gained with that crowd and the rise of the cell phones that are always going off. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. But I, I think I think also the process is um, very much like what's happened in the art world. It's a, it's a process of branding mm. that people want want a simple explanation, and they've thought of me if they thought of me at all as as oh the London walking thing, psychogeography, all of these terms. And actually, that's not a lot. I mean, it's a part of what I do, but it's far from everything I do. And if I try and do something different that doesn't fit with that description, it's, it's rarely popular. It's always challenged. That's not, not what you should be doing. As if Rachel Whitreed, having made casts of houses or whatever, can only go on doing casts for the rest of her life. Mm. Um, and the, the mobile phone, I think, does, does play a part in that because I've found that students who come to, to, to talk about what I do, which they do quite regularly, very often haven't actually read the books. I mean, they are actually oh, not at all. No, hardly at all. They are, oh. but they they feel quite engaged with the what I'm talking about. Mm. But they're doing it because they're listening to podcasts, right? Sure, <laughs> like like this one, for example. And they've looked at some interview on YouTube, right? And they've seen a reference in an Alan Moore comic. I mean, this right. kind of picture right. builds up from all these fragments, right? But it doesn't. And and you may have read three or four pages that have been mm. downloaded, but you do not work your way through the entire hmm. mapping of a book, because that's an old-fashioned old process. When one of these students does read a whole book of yours, what, what do they... Do you know how they react yeah, to that? Have. <laughs> no, no, I have. No, I've never happened. No, I've never I've met somebody who actually got a first-class degree in Cambridge without ever having, as he said to me, completed a whole book. Ah, he just selectively read it's, here and there. And yeah, yeah, bits. There are, there are kind of passages that they pick up on this right. one one in the beginning of lights out for the territory which describes the process of walking and yeah. has a bit about graffiti and um the stalker the few the flaneur all the all these kind of tropes that are in there yes. and they've got those four pages done they're not going to plow through the rest of it to see how it connects and i right. i never got that you know as if i wanted to be a successful writer i should have learned a way just to to kind of encapsulate these uh, key things and cut out all the other <laughs> stuff which interests me and and uh, and do a more like a Balladian list type right. book which people could oh yeah I get it you know and there it is but that's unfortunately that's not how it works. Mm. You mentioned they don't read the whole thing and see how it connects. That seems like it's the whole appeal of reading your books though is to see how everything connects. So it's hard to say what what are they well, getting out of it, it if they don't it if they don't know have that. What do they get out of it? Well, well they get out of it a series of uh, sort of cartoons, mm -hmm. sort of cultural cartoons of, yeah. of which they essentially turn to themselves very quickly, you know, like mm -hmm. I well I've been going out photographing all the graffiti on a street in Wandsworth or uh, I've been making records of cards I found in telephone books, whatever, whatever. Right. Uh, it all, it becomes your own project yeah. with the sort of things I do as, as giving a permission to, to undertake these slightly weird, ah. slightly walking, slightly collecting, stalking, scavenging projects to do with London. They have a precedent then. They have a precedent, exactly, mm -hmm. um, even though that isn't actually true. <laughs> Because they think they have one. They think they have one, but Mark, yes. as far as I'm concerned, the, the the business is about trying to make shapes and trying to um, have recognitions of things that I don't know when I'm starting out, mm. and to to bring it through to some quite 
complex equation, and and that isn't generally. I mean, I'm generalizing hugely, but there there's definitely a strand of of academic interest, sub academic interest, that behaves in in the way I've described to you, hmm. and I think that probably applies to to the reading of London as a whole. Ah. You, know, you know that there is this cult of psychogeography, as it's called, as has right. emerged that has created a series of figures that they think relate to this, people like Arthur Mack and the Welsh writer, or Blake. Even Ballard is is woven into it. And, mm. you know, although I picture him in a car, but... Well, yeah, he's in a car, but he's, he's with the sort of... Uh, the, the engagement with the hinterland of Shepperton and, yes. and Heathrow and the Thames Valley sits within the general description of uh, mm. how you behave in the city. Right, it's... It's to do more with place than a specific mode of going through that place. Then, I think I think it's both. Um, mm. Mm. I think it's reading the architecture of things like the West Way mm. and treating it as if it was an Aztec ruin. All of those things fit mm. with this way of looking at a city. Mm. When was there a, a point early on where you thought to yourself you were writing about London, or have you ever has it mattered to you that you? were or were not consciously thinking, I'm writing about London. I, I could clarify that a little more, but did, did you think you were just writing, you were connecting everything that you perceived or that you were writing about London? I don't think I ever had the sense of writing about London as someone like Peter Ackroyd, let's say, did. That he he actually made a career of almost identifying himself with the city and his mm. his London is a sort of autobiography of Peter Ackroyd yes. through the aspects of London that, that intrigued him. Um, but I, I certainly recognised, um, probably in the period I was working as a gardener in Limehouse and, and in uh, Truman's Brewery in Brick Lane, that, that what fascinated me and what I wanted to explore for a long time was what was going on around me in terms of the city. I was, mm. I'd grown up uh, cutting my teeth on on the American poet Charles Olson and uh, his take on the fishing port of Gloucester, Massachusetts, mm. that that you just did find out all the sp specific particulars of the politics and history and foundation of that place, and then once you got this material, you sort of forced it out into a wider mm. sweep of the cosmos at large, and you created your own mythology. And and I, I was deeply intrigued by the sort of mythology of East London, really, mm. rather than London as a whole. The Riverine London, the Wapping, Limehouse, and the ghetto of Whitechapel and its relation to the city, that you had respectability and you had low life and energy and markets very close together, mm. so that it was very much the metaphor of Robert Louis Stevenson in Jekyll and Hyde, that you have one house with a a respectable doctor at the front of it, uh, okay. and then you go out through the back porch, and you're into the, into the ghetto. You're into the mm -hmm. kind of low life world, mm -hmm. and and that that's such a such a key image of Victorian London, the psychopathology of Victorian London. It's something people still claim to engage with today, isn't it? The, the, the mixture, the old and the new, next to each other, the rich and the poor, the high life and the low life. I mean, I would think. From what you've said and from from what you've written to an extent that that doesn't exist in quantity anymore, but it, it must if people are still talking about it, right? Yeah, London is always schizophrenic. That yes. from from its very foundations and and the religions that came in with the Roman legionaries, the Mithraism, which was a, a religion of darkness and light, mm. the two things coexisted, and I, th I think that's been London all all along. Um, People, people accumulating money and wealth and creating these huge structures, mm. uh, great cathedrals or great banking houses, mm. and then right alongside there would be these uh, rookeries, these mm. tiny spaces full of all, of all of the people who are actually working or labouring or, or struggling to survive, and there would be the constant I immigration of uh, people from... Uh, the expelled Jewish Jewish people from elsewhere, escaping pogroms or Huguenot weavers, whatever, pouring in mm. that, that that formed new new groupings and and allowed more and more people from the same sites to turn up um, and and be invisible to the the more established population. 
who were also coming in constantly from the country uh, where, where the agricultural life wasn't working anymore and, and struggling to kind of somehow rip a living out of this city as well as the discharged armies of all the various colonial wars who were also turning up, being thrown onto the streets of London. So it, it, had, a, it had an element of being difficult, dangerous and, and physically quite hard to walk about in. If you wanted to walk from Fleet Street to Westminster, as Peeps describes, the the mud, the filth, mm. the dirt, the shit running into the streets. Yes, yes, we, are, we, smell, don't, we never think about that today. All yeah. of those things were horrendous. <laughs> so the only way to move was actually on the water. Yes. So there are thousands of these wherries and little boats that became the taxi service of London. If you could afford it, right. you stayed on the water. If you didn't have the money, you were in the mud. Mm. Hmm. And prostitutes, I mean, used to foregather around places like St. Paul's Cathedral. So, so you, exactly, you had the, the, the gilded domes and all of the, the rituals and the money, and you had the other side of it absolutely along, alongside it. It's these qualities of London, it seems like, that send, uh, send people's imaginations going, even when they're just trying to describe London flatly, objectively. It feels like everybody gets into fiction when they start talking about London, don't they? Yeah, because it's not a, it's not a rational city, mm. so London. I mean, you, mm. you, 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 if you try to describe it in a documentary sense, for me, you, you very soon tip over that edge in, into a sort of fiction-making <laughs> or, or mythologizing. Mm. Um, someone, someone like Dickens was, was an immense London walker. I mean, he claimed to to walk about 15 miles, often walk at night endlessly, talking to night watchmen and going around with detectives and so on, uh, and absorbing this material often often in, next day in a, in a documentary sense and heating it up a bit and pitching it till it becomes this fictionalised reality. Mm. And you can sometimes get at the, the real truth by heating up and exaggerating and treating in those ways, which is what I've done all along. And Something like Down River is categorized as fiction, but it was absolutely based on the journeys and the walks and the people I was meeting in an exaggerated form right. and a sort of contemplation of, I thought, the consequences of Thatcherism, mm. whereas uh, American Smoke passes as a documentary, but in many ways there's lots of manipulations of that material right. to me to make a different kind of novel. The construction of them is fairly close in that way, then. The, the mixture of fact and fiction... Down River and American Smoke, they may be separated by uh, over 20 years, but they're not, they're not different works at their core, are they? No, I think they're not. I think, mm. I think they're, they're very much the same, because uh, also, as these books have accumulated, I've always uh, used the new books to interrogate aspects of the previous books before mm. and to see things that hold up and things that shift and change, as mm. if I can't quite believe my own existence <laughs> in those earlier yeah. entities. I mean, it's like very exciting when you... It's different if you, say, a shot a piece of film in, in the very time I was making Down River and look at that piece of film. It, it looks strangely old and of its period, because mm. it is. But mm. reading, actually, what's the textually what was done, it's not so strange. Mm. This is the thing I'm writing now about the railway. I was looking at stuff I'd written in uh, Down River about the privatization of the railway and what happened at that period and realized it was an uncanny description of what I'd just done the day before as a description of what was happening now. <laughs> and in the same way, yeah, I think Ballard is often held up to be yes. a prophetic writer, but his everything is right. just lifted from whatever was going on in the world of the magazines and newspapers and films of that moment. Right, right, it, right. Wasn't, he didn't think of himself as science fiction predictive. He just thought of himself as being particularly sharp about what was happening <laughs> right now. But then the media would ring him up as a prophet, would they not, and say, can you give me a quote on this thing that's a lot like your dystopia that you wrote about a few years back, right? Yeah, because why wouldn't it be? It's, yes. it's, I can't think these things are inevitable. I've always yeah. thought that if you get, a, you get an accurate description of something here, then there's a sort of trajectory that carries on, and the, 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 the moment this is realized is... You know, it's it's inevitable. Mm. I was reading Don DeLillo book from the 1970s, mm. um, and he's describing these people standing on the roof of a building, looking at the the twin towers and seeing a plane go into it. You right. know, all all of that psychology is exactly. You could have read it as a, something that was written after the event, but mm. it's written mid 70s. Mm. Mm. Now, you 
you have a you have a measure of. I, f- I feel like your books are both. You re- reading your books. There's both ambiguity if you want it, and a total lack of ambiguity if you want that as well. You know, you, people people will read what they want to read in your books, but it's not because you're vague, right? I, I try not to be. Right. I try to be very specific. Right, and in that specificity, it comes because of the various... I mean, people interpret your books in all kinds of ways, yet you're so specific. I wonder what you think about if that's conscious at all or a surprise to you that that happens. Well, I think getting the responses that people make of your material, yes, that's always, always surprising hmm. because I think the nature of it is to get very locked down in, in some curious take on the world, which, which for me all goes back to uh, earliest training, which was in um, a sort of modernist poetic, mm-hmm. I guess, where you didn't have to consider an audience. You were, you were absolutely mm-hmm. addressing, if anything, a small group of peers who understood the same references right. and you didn't need to explain. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, obviously, if it's a mainstream publication, there is a certain necessity to make the terms clear and to, and so I'm trying to do that without mm. uh, selling it out completely mm. and um, things that seem very obvious to me <laughs> clearly are not it was a partly where you get battered for putting in too many references but uh, I mean if that's you know, the I, core I don't of know your... what is allowed to be referred to anymore <laughs> because you, you know, if you're writing for the Evening Standard, you have to say the Elizabethan playwright William right. Shakespeare. Right. And there is not assumed that you know anything. And I'm, I'm quite happy when I read other texts from writers in other countries uh, that I don't know at all, that they're, they're spraying out these specific references. I'm, I'm happy to take that. As a, and if I right. want to follow them up, then, you know, go and right. chase it up, find it out. Otherwise, uh, it's your world, and I'm, I'm very happy to enter it. That seems to be your idea with your readers, is you can, you can pursue these references or you or can not. not. I mean, it's your choice. Absolutely, your yes. choice. I think, you know, you're embarking on a journey right. and, and uh, some of the references hopefully are very straightforward, but there's going to be other ones which are not. Mm-hmm. Obviously, in terms of the sheer density of the particulars of London, no, you're not going to know. How could you know that? Right. Either you want to enter this as a sort of fictional city. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's a Tolkien invention or something, people will, J.K. Rowling, people will go into this fantastic world and accept these weird names and events, but they won't do it with a book about London. Because it's rooted in a place they think of as real. When reading enough of your books, they would would discover the unreality they too could have access to if they were... The the bonus of London, I think, more than a lot of cities, is that it it has this hyper-reality. It has Mm. this sort of the sense of hierarchy I mentioned before that there are there's a labyrinthine London and physically there's a lot going on under it but there are also these buildings to which you don't have access this sort of right. clubbishness this sort of masonic secrecies of London all of those things the privileges that let you into certain buildings mm. uh, the ways of behaviour all, all of that um, and uh, at the same same time there's a there's an overriding sense of conspiracy and an overriding sense of the occulted and an overriding sense of sheer business, money-making, mm. the reality of survive or don't survive. There is kind of, it's brutal in lots of ways. And in other ways, there have always been the, the anarchic figures mm. who won't buy into that world and right. have set up alternative communities or uh, camping out now in, in wilderness bits under motorways or out, out in the parklands towards Stratford. All, all of this goes on at the same time. Mm. And the worse things get in some senses and, and the better the quality of the opposition. Mm. Mm. Observing this mixture in London, I, I want to know what, what are some of the what you thought were your least likely interests that the city connected to. What, what did you find explorations of London leading you to that you were, you were surprised it could? You know, we all have, we all have things we, we think we have a, an array of disparate interests, and then we find that, oh, something does connect them all. I mean, is London, is London your optimal connector for those things? What, what didn't you expect to connect to London? Right, that I, didn't, in fact, I didn't expect people that 
to connect to London as a subject for oh, a start. Readers. Re- readers, I'm talking about re- readers or an interest in London as a topic because, uh, let's say, in the 1960s period, it was about London, although London was being pitched as swinging city and all that, yes. in fact, the writers who were writing about real London life were unable to get published. You know, mm. me- meeting a writer like Alexander Barron, who'd written about Hackney and mm. wrote a famous book called The Low Life, and had written a series of books about London in the 1950s and 60s, and several other writers of that generation mm. were saying they absolutely could not get their work published because London was thought to be a subject that didn't sell. Well, how could so, that be? Well, because the, the interest had, had switched to uh, books about the north of England. Oh, I see. It was a kind of slightly homoerotic interest <laughs> in working class rugby players, sure. you know, your kind of sporting life, um, room at the top, all of these things. The, 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 the Oxbridge young men were yeah. interested in that. So, so for, for a period... London and the metropolis was was reckoned to be dull, other than total fantasy, James Bondish, <laughs> uh, spies, nightclubs, that kind of that sort of right. fantasy London. The real London, absolutely out of. So that was a surprise to me, right. uh, and it didn't happen overnight because mid seventies when I was doing some book like Blood Heat, mm-hmm. it seemed completely obscure and off the map and nobody would ever be interested. And it was only in that later period, in the 1980s, when, when uh, Peter Ackroyd really kicked in and turned the same material into Hawksmoor, which was a big bestseller. Mm. And then people like Michael Moorcock wrote Mother London, which was a huge mm. Dickensian take on London, that London suddenly became a sort of sexy topic again. And people were then thinking, what is London? What is the meaning and mythology of London? And then, uh, obviously, now uh, uh, people are own Hathaway, whatever, uh, looking at at London in in a very different way again. Anna Minton is arguments in public and private space and the politicisation of London and what's happening in economics and architecture and all of that. Mm. And that was certainly not possible a while back. When you began writing London, we, those questions didn't matter to people. What is London? Who, who cares? It never, it never, what is London never arrived as a question for me at all yes. until there's an there's a actual episode I, I referenced in a, in a book called Liquid City. Mm. I was walk, just doing a series of walks that had been done in um, Lights Out for the Territory, but, but with the photographer Mark Atkins and... We were going to see um, a man called Eric Mottram, who was an academic and who lived in South London. And I just said, the photographer knew nothing whatsoever about him, so I thought it would be interesting if we did a walk from Hackney to where this guy lived. Mm -hmm. And during the course of that walk, I would tell him everything I could think of to do with this man, and he would then, when he arrived, take a portrait of him. Mm -hmm. So that was the project. After how long a walk was this? This was a walk of about three or four hours because we were wandering about in various ways. Anyway, we were across the river um, somewhere about Shooter's Hill, you know, beyond Greenwich and this French guy came charging across the road to me and said, is this London? Now this really became a kind of a, we stopped and we all went to the cafe and we had a discussion about, is this London? And I thought, well, is it? Because it's not the London that I, I'm writing about and describing and talking and knowing. And right. it wasn't the London this French guy thought of either, because hmm. he'd been trying to come into London and he'd got completely lost in these sort of South London suburban streets. And he was wondering, was this another town that would become London? And at what point would it become London? Yes. And it says, well, what, you, what is London? I kind of said to him, and he said, well... He's looking for such and such record stores on Oxford Street, and he Uh, kind of knew various things, and none of them were visible from where he was there, because you're in this... It's a long way from there. So then we we gave serious thought to to what is London. What did you conclude? Was that a London, perhaps? If it was not the London? Exactly. Well, it was was not his London. It was not the London that was wanted, Mm -hmm. and that was the image of of what French people in general thought of of London as that time. Mm. And it was on the very perimeter of what I thought of as London, because I had my own sort of map of a particular territory, Mm. and this wasn't it either. Um, On the other hand, I was 
you could see the Thames glinting in the distance, and I mm. wasn't very far from where Antonioni made blow up in Marion oh, yes. Park and all of those things. So he he made that part of London, which Londoners didn't before mm. they they'd never seen Marion Park in general till till a European director finds this interesting location and links it up with a photographer who's operating out of West London which mm. is the swinging London yeah. as people imagine it Indeed. so there are all, the, all of these multiple multiple Londons so. it's a question that comes up a lot in Los Angeles where I where I've come from mm. which it's so big and yeah. the area around it is bigger and no one quite knows where it begins and ends because that's the border is all wonky that's kind of the nature of that's how people think of Los Angeles as right. a enormous spread right. they don't right. think of it as being specific to and its history is that right. you know in real terms Right. Um, and the same, funnily enough, the same thing started to happen in Dublin at the time of the Celtic Tiger boom, is that estates started <laughs> telescoping out from Dublin and stretching miles up the coast, even yes. though they failed. So it, it could theoretically have become a kind of Los Angeles spread, except that it would have had an old established center somewhere. Right, right. Well, right. maybe Los Angeles doesn't in the same way. Mm. It, it, it has a center that was was the center in the early 20th, 20th century, stopped being it in the late 20th century, and started being it again recently. So this, the center, what is the center, keeps, the, the notion keeps changing in Los Angeles. I feel like in, in London, the center doesn't move, does it? Whatever may happen, you don't say... No, you've got, you've got these fixed points, yeah. and it, when it was interesting, the, the psychiatrist, the anti-psychiatrist, who was quite influential in the 1960s, mm -hmm. R.D. Lang, started to talk a lot to, to damaged um, psychotic individuals, to, to ask them to define what was the key centre of London and their consciousness. Ah. And it, a uniform wow. thing did start to emerge. Mm. And it was, it was weird because it was, it was first you kind of zoomed into Buckingham Palace mm. and then actually to the physical body of the Queen herself, mm. her, her womb or whatever was in their minds, <laughs> in their <laughs> deepest <laughs> recesses, they thought that was London. And that's quite interesting because that kind of played back to Elizabeth I and mm. the kind of founding of, of London as, as a power that's coming out of the obscurities of medieval philosophy and into a modern world with John Dee as an imperial geographer. Hmm. So I, I mean, if, if, if I asked you, as someone who's come to London, is there, is there a kind of defining sense of an image of centre? Right, it's, and to which I would say, well, the centre for me is where I'm staying on Bethnal Green. The center is near Brick Lane because that's where I have radiated out from on my journeys. That's where I've, you know, I start out each day. The center of London, I realize, if there was an objective sense, would not be Brick Lane, but... But it kind of has become it in lots, lots of weird ways. Mm. Um, I mean, I, the, the, I was interesting enough because I was working in, in Brick Lane, mm. in Truman's Brewery, oh. in a cellar. There's an alleged <laughs> cellar where all the returned beers were sent back. Oh, wow. And you tested it and you poured them into a huge lead tank underneath this. And then, while I was working there, literally a, a developer came in and, and took over the brewery, um, promising he was going to keep it going. But it was clearly already a, a speculation to buy up all the dead and, and low-rated land up the length of Brick Lane towards the railway, knowing this future development was going to occur. Right. And it, it, yeah, this is, this is mid-1970s, Brick Lane was like a kind of desert. There was one, one in Indian restaurant, Nazrul we used to go to. No women would have set foot in there. Um, it was really, it was another world. Right. And it was not. It was the centre of something, but it was not the centre of London. Right. It was right, the right. centre of what is not the city, and there's a hinterland in between. And yet, in that period that followed, it became the epicentre of a kind of a, a heritage, um, an art London, uh, a, a, sh a thing full of re retro shops. Yeah, and, so very and many and vintage all, shops. All of this stuff and and so streams pop up, and pop -up markets and things. And, hundreds of Indian restaurants, except right. they often share the same kitchen behind. If you went oh, behind, really? three different restaurants have the same kitchen. I've got to try that. There's all kinds of... In the same way that I was excited being in there because there was an underworld of these tanks with all yes. the brewery, which you could go into tunnels, 
And also you could go up onto the roofs and you could skitter along the roofs right as far as Christchurch <laughs> Spitalfield. So there was up and down and all of that yeah. was secret and all of it was accessing the Victorian period because mm. uh, the, 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 there were people there who actually were going around taking uh, elaborate long exposure shots of all the sites where the murders of Jack the Ripper or oh, whatever course, had taken place. Course. And yet, at that time, they, was, they were mostly intact. They were as they had looked then. And mm. now, of course, it's awash with these <laughs> tour groups <laughs> trundling around, sort of licking the blood up from the cobblestones. No doubt. <laughs> you know, is, it, is it a fruitful question for you, wherever you're going, in London or, indeed, any other city, to ask, wherever I'm standing now, what is this the center of? Well, where, where you're standing now is, is the, the center of your own being, I mean, the transmissions that you've made and you, you've brought from other places and you've created your own microclimate from which you push out and, and, uh, and try and, and, and fix your own compass bearings. Mm. I mean, otherwise, I don't, think, I don't think places have that kind of center. Mm. It's, not a, it's not a relevant thing. There is no center. Mm. London lacks that center. There are a number of centers pertinent to whatever your interests are. There are these lumps of established architecture, mm. obviously, Buckingham Palace, St. Paul's, Houses of Parliament, whatever, whatever. And yet what happens then at something like the London Eye or right. the Millennium Dome or these... these Frivolous. <laughs> not, not your favorite pieces of architecture. Things. They're, they're very ephemeral, I think, yes. but yet they, they form in themselves new centers for, right. for other people's ideas of London. Right. Uh, the South Bank is now this zone where loads of people walk up and down between these various things, and that, right. that makes a, kind of a new park like London. It's not, mm. it's not my London, but then neither is Buckingham Palace, which is itself just a accidental grand <laughs> shed that was put up at a particular <laughs> point in time doesn't mean anything so would you would you look for what was the original mythical central london was something called the london stone mm. which was a stone that was there from which all journeys in the rest of britain were mm. were marked out mm. and that stone now sits in the, in the basement of a bank <laughs> <gasps> there's also these places that are that almost aggressively try to centerize themselves, you know, like a canary wharf, something like that. And you can feel that they're just trying to, oh, I'm, I'm the center, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a center. Well, you can, you, can, you can kind of be the center by being tall. Uh, yes, I guess that's You know, true. this is kind of a phallic competition to be who's, who's the, the tallest and most extreme and most outrageous building. If you can do that, then you, you become a new center because we can't avoid you. Wherever, whatever yeah. street we're in, we're looking... <laughs> We were looking at the gherkin. Well, you become now, a reference. You become cannot, someone's reference. avoid that bloody shard. It's, yes. it's, it's everywhere. And yet nobody wants to be in it. It's, it's yes. empty apart from a very expensive restaurant at the top. Oh, my. Is it really not and occupied? It's, it's not occupied oh as God. yet. I mean, it's sort of maybe it doesn't really matter. They've got this chunk of real estate. Right. And it becomes a, a reference point in that people want to climb up it, you know, sure. and then people will spend a lot of money to go and sit in the restaurant at the top or whatever, mm. whatever. But it's not a center of anything but itself. Mm, mm. Now, what is the best way you found to access the Londons of the mind that other people have that they built up? You can ask them about it, but how do you discover someone else's mental London? Uh, do you have? Would you have to have them lead you around? Would you have to, if they've read a book, if they've written a book, read that? How do you access another's mental London? Well, I mean. If they're writers, you, you simply, I mean, if I read... They make it easy, yes. If I read Mother London, I, I could access very easily the London of Michael Moorcock, who's somebody who I know has, has lived in London and thought about London wow. for much of his life. And he has created this uh, London in that book, which is um, very much posited on the idea of the, the Blitz and the eradication of London in the Second World War, which is when he's growing up as a young kid, and um, sees the, the older London being destroyed around him and figures emerging from the blazing buildings and walking out. And they're all thereafter traumatized. And you're, in, you're into the London of the 1950s, which is very diminished and impoverished and gray, yeah. and it's full of building sites and rubble. And that's exciting in a way as well as a kid. You know, it's a it's a city of apocalypse out of which something new will come, and that fixes him. And then other other cities like 
Peter Ackroyd's London, I think, is, is a London of disguise. Mm. It's to do with um, demonstrating heritage, but also there seems to be something going on underneath which is never quite revealed, oh. faked. I mean, it's partly to do with not... I, get, I mean, I think he doesn't want to to write a sort of full-blown gay take on London, mm. which... So he does all kinds of uh, other ludic things with the city. It's around that. It's around that. It's yes. around, around the notion of disguise and display mm. and performance and music hall and travesty and all, all of those things which mm. make... So all of these people have very different Londons but often using the same materials. And if they're not writers, how do you get if, access? If they're not writers... Um, I don't know, because I'm, I'm a writer, so, so I, I don't, I don't know necessarily be able to break the code of different right. people who right, see right. different lines, other than, you know, you accidentally meet and get in a conversation and realise that other people are looking at the same street mm. in a totally different way. Yeah. I mean, if, for example, you were the person who lives just across the road here and you're an estate agent, you actually look at the, the city with, a, with a, a very sharp eye, but a, it's a kind of predatory eye. Right, right. Will that pub become... Can I convert it and sell it as a building? Ah, or close it down? The plans, that's Will that petrol station become a, right. a new development or something else? So yes, you're, yes. you're actually looking at it in the same way as a writer, but and whereas I'm exploiting it because I think, will this material shape and structure into a book? Mm. They're thinking, can I get a project out of this? Mm, it's, it's funny, you know, I, reading your books, reading bo the books of others that I've talked to here, it's... The, the mental London I have is, is almost entirely built out of that, those kind of texts or the mental London I had before I came. You know, I do things like um, the writer Jeff Dyer is, is a friend, and he has an essay where he writes about remembering the 1980s when he lived in Brixton and how he just got so weary of this road he had to walk on to get to the bus every day, um, Ephra Road, I believe it is, and he says he just he wore it down in his Ephra mind with his... Okay. The interesting thing is, you know, just even just saying F for a road, yes. you've opened up... Yes, here's the connection. Here we go. Because then <laughs> I, you do think of, he has to walk this road every single day. Okay, yeah. well, that road is named after a lost river. Right. So there is actually a submerged road. So again, you're back to geographical particulars. Right. And then also, you know, I can't help thinking of it's a poet called Alan Fisher who lived also down there, and he wrote a book called Place, which was again a, a post Olson book starting in Brixton, mm. in which he followed rivers, he did all kinds of strange things, and he <laughs> saw the book. His London was um, a form of accumulation. Ah. He just took evidence and evidence, and the book got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, enormous, it was as if it could never end. And right. it's published as a series of little self-published pamphlets, but then it becomes, at the end, an enormous book. And so I think there's an impulse to that in London. Right. How do you, how do you know when to end your books? How do you know when to stop writing? Well, they, they, they don't end. Yeah, That's yeah. the truth. It's, it's kind a, of one big book. It's one, yes, it's, it's one big book, right. and uh, you know, a new form or a new version just right. uh, seems to pop up so far. The so, publisher says that's what will pay to print. Stop there. Yeah, do yeah, the next well, one. Well, that's that's it. That's what defines a book is what someone else will pay to print, <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's getting harder. <laughs> yes, and indeed, indeed, and but probably will disappear. It's uh, this Ephra Road I just went down to for no other reason than that I read his essay a few times over, over the last couple of years, and I thought, I just want to go experience this part of someone else's mental London. Not that I thought it wouldn't I would... be the same now. I mean, right, it's know, not, so, course, He wrote at a particular point in time. About you know, the 80s as well. There and it's now hugely different yeah. already. I suppose so, but to me, it's the only Ephra Road I've ever actually seen or experienced, so that is it to me, and it's also this textual entity. But there's... There's this desire that I and many have to experience the London or other cities of people's minds, you know, the places that have been referenced, just because they've been referenced by other people, by writers they've read or what have you, by friends. But as well, in not just cities, tell me, with, with the new book American Smoke, how did, your, how did the America of your mind form, and are the beats at the core of that, or what is at the core? Uh, well, America was, was a sort of adventure of uh, a romance of, of youth, my, my early reading, not, not just the Beats, but uh, the Beats became central to it, um, and, and the Black Mountain poets particularly, yes. um, and, and the accident of then, in, when I was very young, in the 60s, getting to make this film with Allen Ginsberg at this moment of the... Uh, Congress of Dialectics of Liberation in the Roundhouse. So everything, all the ideas that I'd had were up and, and cooking. And um, 
friends friends of mine really were probably going to America physically, just the same group of people, either going there and and probably never coming back, mm. or, or or possibly staying in Ireland. And and right. there was very little that stayed in London. And ah. I, I took the decision really. To, well, it wasn't. I didn't think about it very much, but I I, I stuck with London, and so America just was something else. It was remained a mythological. Remained a mythological place, right. and the the mythologies of of being young teenager or whatever were, were getting then challenged by by a sense of the political realities of America and mm -hmm. Vietnam and all of that. Yeah. So America is kind of alien in some ways. I don't want to go there. And in the other sense, I'm very excited by these writers. And so yeah. just it remained in limbo as a mm -hmm. and then uh, by the mid nineties I think I went for the actually physically went for the first time mm -hmm. by the accident of doing a BBC radio program, which let me revisit all the old beats, who, who then were not what I expected. I mean, oh, I'd yes. met some of them, but then I, you know, as I was saying, you ask them what's their London, and they they keep saying Agatha Christie and P.G. Woodhouse oh, and yes. Alan Bennett, and I thought, Christ, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you could also see how they self-curated to become sort of museum pieces of themselves. Oh, my. It was, it was all of that, and so it was all. It was very fascinating, and then finally, a really series of trips, um, having a little more time to myself, looking at the terrain and wandering about, and, and using the same methodology that I would use in London. How did it apply to these landscapes? And I was, I was very drawn into them, even though it was quite a limited amount of time. I. I, li I liked it a lot, and I was looking, you know, as so was a chance of interrogating the ghosts of my own youth and shaping a new a new structure around it. It was a really kind of a important book to do at that point, I think, because uh, uh, after the sort of intensity of ghost milk, which right. felt like a de defeat in the sense that all the things I was going on about had had uh, happened and seemed to be tri oh, Olympic building. triumphantly enacted around the Olympic period, this sort of mass hallucination. Mm. Now it's great again because it's all over and you can you can see the devastated aftermath of all that, yeah, which is going to be it. really interesting over the next few years, seeing how that changes and emerges. Often described as soon, uh, as, as near future ruins, these Olympic constructions. Exactly, you know, mm. uh, in saying in Ghost Map that... Um, Athens can cope with near future ruins. We're not. We're not so good because <laughs> they've got to do something. But now you've got these acres of housing that that are being bought um, by offshore investors and not not occupied at the same time as the local population is being expelled into other parts of Britain. Mm. Have you spent much time in America since uh, you were recording that uh, BBC series? Uh, no, I, I think I went. I went. Um, I did the BBC series and mid-90s, and I went back a couple of years later with Chris Pettit, yes. where we made a film called Asylum. We were, we were in Texas and Arizona. And then I've, since then I've been maybe three or uh, four times or so, um, either doing something in Austin, Texas, or in San Francisco, mm. and then this one trip right down the West Coast, which we made. So uh, it's not a lot of time. What ways has that America you've, you've directly experienced, though, influenced the America in your mind? Is there is there a notable way? It's different now. I mean, I kind of sense, although I, nothing was totally different to, right. to what I, because it's not only a question of having read a lot of books, but just having seen those infinite images you know, right. through cinema and everything else. Vast you know. landscapes, the road, it's the road. recognizable, <laughs> but and yet it, it isn't, you know, it, yes. it, it isn't. It's smell and it's feel is different mm. and um, the, the poets were much more sort of embattled mm. I felt than, mm. than the ones I knew here it was because they're, they're much more spaced out if you're right. as everyone is in the US you're up in the <laughs> Sierra Nevada you're a long way from things civilization yeah, yeah. but oh obviously there's an enormous cluster around San Francisco and right. Berkeley and all that right um, but you know, I didn't. I didn't feel. I, I'm going to come and live here. This is. I, I want to be part of this. But yeah. I was. I was very fascinated to to be there. The only. I, I haven't spent really any time at all in New York apart mm -hmm. from this first visit. 
where I was constantly having to do what you're doing now. Yes. You know, interviewing about f five people a day. It's a good way to explore that Which if you go is, to them. It's a good way, but then it needs the gaps in between. Right. When, you, when you're doing what you're doing, you have time to just sort of walk around and get a feel before you, before you do that. Otherwise, the insanity of moving from here <laughs> to talk to Melvin Bragg in Primus Hill or something, you could go a little crazy. <laughs> it can happen, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to go to places. You know, when I go to people, I go to where it's convenient for them, and therefore I, I find a pathway through London that I never would have found for myself. And, yeah. and any place you go, you need some device like that, don't you? Because otherwise you, you follow the tourist route, and it's so well-worn, you're sort of getting a mental place installed in your mind that's already fixed. Yeah. Well, I say I was in Seattle. I mean, I, I imposed on all of these places this notion of doing this circular walk yes. for so many hours every morning regardless of where I was or what it was. So that then threw up certain markers that seemed mm. to be common to all of these places. Mm. And also, if you could possibly take a boat trip, I would do it. Yes. Or a bus trip or a walk, just to the extreme limits of the place. Those, those kind of things seem to, even if you don't know anything about it, mm. If I was in London now and, and, and just set off, literally, either north, south, east or west and walk till you come to the edge of the city, that's telling you an awful lot. Mm. This is something I asked Jonathan Meads a few weeks ago on this show, but I will put it to you as well. Do, do you think that place is sort of the, the, the most robust nexus of interests there is? It seems that way for me. Is it, is it for you? I think, I think place is exactly the, the most robust nexus of influence for me mm. and, and always has been. I, um, I, I, I feel that place, all, all that I've ever done is articulate aspects mm. of place, nothing more than that. And, and so moving, moving to another place is immediately letting loose another set of narratives, like spending quite a lot of time over the last ten years down on the south coast mm. in this strange um, boat building, 1930s <laughs> boat building in Hastings, meant another whole book, you know, kicked off around that. And, mm -hmm. and a film with Chris Pettit called Marine Court Rendezvous, which is an installation piece entirely based on the, the, the fact of place, mm. which is in part um, what it is, but it's also in part a representation of Hackney in the 1960s, drifting out... Mm. Because what happens in London, I think there's this tectonic plate effect that happens, is that Hackney 1960 does not disappear, it's just not in Hackney anymore. Ah, uh, it's, it's, it's shifted and drifted. Off. It That's drifts right. off, and it, all the aspects of it are gone, mm. although physically the place is still here. Yes, yes. And yet it's... There's it's the place and then there's the place. You've got, yes. you've got ghost architectures right. full of traces of what was gone before, mm. But the human spirit and the way that it all happened has gone somewhere else. Mm. And at the moment, uh, that it's drifting down to the south coast because economically, the, the factors that would have set you up here now set you up there. Ah. And that does become one way of reading England and London, mm. is this constant migration of the, like Olson said, the migration is the, is the constant in human history. Mm. I've been speaking here in Hackney for certain definitions of Hackney with Ian Sinclair, author of fiction, essays, poetry, books that combine them in a geographical framework like Downriver, Lights Out for the Territory, Hackney, That Rose Red Empire, Ghost Milk, London Orbital, The New American Smoke, and many, many more. Ian, thanks so much. Thank you very much. That was really, really uh, an interesting take and a new way of, of um, bringing me back to life in the middle of a project. Thank you. <laughs> This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andrzej Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, 
Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Plosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Wagelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.